In May of 2015, the tranquil life of the small town of Sand Lake, Michigan, was disrupted by a shocking event. This village of about 500 residents, located 27 miles north of Grand Rapids, was typically associated with a picturesque lake, a few family restaurants, and peaceful rural living. However, behind the facade of this idyllic picture, a tragedy was brewing that would soon shake the entire community. On the outskirts of Sand Lake, in a house on East 128th Street, lived a couple 46-year-old Marty Durham and his 47-year-old wife, Glenna. To neighbors and acquaintances, they seemed like an ordinary married couple leading a measured life. Marty, despite his disability due to a car accident, often helped neighbors by mowing their lawns and clearing driveways in winter. Glenna was his official caregiver. Together, they hosted annual pig roast parties for friends and neighbors. However, behind this picture of well-being lay serious problems that had been gradually accumulating over the years. Financial difficulties, family conflicts, and personal demons of each spouse created an explosive mixture that eventually led to a tragic resolution. The story of Marty and Glenna began long before their marriage. They first met as teenagers when Marty was 16 and Glenna was 17. A brief romance developed between them, despite the fact that Glenna was already married to a man named Robert. However, this relationship didn't last long. Soon after, Marty met Christina Keller, who became his first wife. They met at a party when Christina was only 14 and Marty was 19. Despite the age difference, a strong feeling arose between them, and at 16, Christina became pregnant with their first child. Over the next few years, they had two more children. Meanwhile, Glenna remained with her husband Robert, giving birth to two children Eric and Laura. However, as later became known, she never completely forgot Marty. She even retained a tattoo of his name on her arm, made in her youth. Marty and Glenna's lives diverged for many years, but fate brought them back together after Marty divorced Christina in 2000. By that time, both had unsuccessful marriages and children behind them. Their reunion seemed like a second chance at happiness, an opportunity to return to the feelings of youth. Soon after rekindling their relationship, Glenna divorced Robert, and she and Marty began living together. After a few years, they officially married, creating a new family that united children from previous marriages. At first glance, it was a happy ending to a long love story. However, reality turned out to be much more complicated than it might have seemed at first. Marty Durham's life changed dramatically in 1995 when he was involved in a serious car accident. Returning home from work, his car was hit by a truck that ran a red light. The consequences of the collision were catastrophic. Marty suffered numerous injuries, fractured ribs, jaw, legs, and severe brain damage. A significant part of his brain was damaged, leading to a prolonged coma. Doctors fought for his life, performing numerous surgeries. The family was told to prepare for the worst. However, Marty survived. After several months in a coma, he woke up, but a long road to recovery lay ahead. He had to relearn how to sit, hold his head up, not to mention more complex movements. His face was disfigured by the accident, and his brain lost some functions. Christina, who was his wife at the time, recalls wheeling Marty to a brain injury treatment center. She was shocked to see people there who had remained incapacitated for decades. Unable to leave Marty in such a place, she took him home against doctor's recommendations, taking on his care herself. After divorcing Christina in 2000 and reuniting with Glenna, Marty's life seemed to take on new meaning. He and Glenna married, hoping for a happy future together. The first years of their marriage were filled with hopes and plans. The couple settled in a house in Sand Lake, trying to create a cozy family nest. Marty, despite his limitations due to injury, tried to be useful he tended the garden and helped neighbors. Glenna became Marty's official caregiver, receiving $3,000 a month for this. Marty also received $1,100 in monthly disability benefits. This money seemed to provide them with a stable financial situation. The couple tried to unite their families. Marty had three children from his marriage to Christina, and Glenna had two from Robert. Creating a blended family was not an easy task, but they strived to do everything possible for harmonious coexistence. 
Marty and Glenna engaged in various activities together. Marty loved hunting and fishing, and Glenna accompanied him on these trips. They also frequently visited local casinos, although Marty wasn't a gambler and just kept his wife company. However, behind the facade of this new life, problems gradually accumulated that would eventually lead to tragic consequences. Behind the external well-being of the Durham family, serious financial difficulties were hidden. Despite regular care and disability payments received by the couple, their financial situation gradually worsened. The main reason for this was Glenna's passion for gambling. She regularly bought lottery tickets worth $5,200 several times a week and often visited casinos. Marty's older brother Dan recalled how during their visit to Montana, Glenna insisted on frequent stops at casinos, where she inserted $100 bills into slot machines. Marty, known for his frugality, tried to save on everything, including heating and lighting the house. However, his efforts could not compensate for Glenna's large gambling expenses. Gradually, the couple began to miss mortgage payments and other bills. Credit history problems arose, which became evident when Marty tried to buy a new car and found that their credit rating had significantly deteriorated. Glenna concealed the scale of financial problems from Marty. She controlled the family finances, taking advantage of her husband's deteriorated memory after the accident. When questions arose about missed payments or debts, Glenna assured Marty that she would take care of everything. Creating a blended family proved to be a challenging task for Marty and Glenna. Children from previous marriages didn't always easily find common ground, which created additional tension in the family. Relations between Glenna and Marty's children were particularly strained. Jessica, Marty and Christina's daughter, recalled that Glenna openly expressed her dissatisfaction with her from the age of eight. Glenna often told Jessica that she looked like her mother, which was perceived as an insult. Marty's sons also felt tension in their relationship with Glenna. The older son, Justin, often conflicted with his stepmother, leading to serious arguments and even being kicked out of the house. Christina, Marty's first wife, initially tried to maintain friendly relations with Glenna for the sake of the children. However, over time, the situation worsened. Glenna began to openly express her dissatisfaction with Christina, which complicated communication between the former spouses. Marty also began to distance himself from his family. He stopped communicating with his sister Donna for a while and didn't speak to another sister Vicky for almost five years. Marty's relatives believed that Glenna contributed to these conflicts, maintaining tension and isolating Marty from the family. Despite these difficulties, Marty remained an important part of his children's and family's lives, although his relationships with them became increasingly complex and strained. An African grey parrot named Bud held a special place in the life of the Durham family. This bird, initially purchased by Christina during her marriage to Marty, became an unusual participant in the family drama. After the divorce, Marty insisted on keeping Bud despite Christina's request to return the bird. This was painful for Christina, as she loved Bud like a family member. Glenna, however, was not a fan of the parrot and rarely paid attention to him. Bud was an extremely intelligent bird, capable of imitating various sounds and voices. He often repeated phrases he heard in the house, including conversations between Marty and Glenna. This ability of the parrot would later play a key role in the investigation of the tragic events. During the 15 years that Bud spent with Marty and Glenna, he rarely left his cage. This sharply contrasted with how he was treated earlier when he lived with Christina and was a full-fledged family member. In the months leading up to the tragedy, tension in the Durham household noticeably increased. Financial problems reached a critical point when it was revealed that the house was at risk of foreclosure due to unpaid mortgage. In April of 2015, a relative of Marty accidentally saw an advertisement for the sale of their house due to debt in a local newspaper. When Marty was informed about this, he was surprised and confused. Glenna assured him that it was a mistake and she would take care of everything. Despite serious financial difficulties, Marty continued to invest money in home improvements. He had recently built a new terrace, updated his man corner in the garage, 
and even repainted the bathroom a few days before the tragedy. This indicated that he was unaware of the real scale of their financial problems. Relations between Marty and Glenna were also becoming increasingly strained. Neighbors and friends noticed that the couple often argued. Sometimes their disputes escalated into threats, although those around them perceived it as jokes. Donna, Marty's sister, recalled that Glenna often made unpleasant comments about Marty in the presence of other people, saying she wanted to leave him or give him to someone else. Although this was presented as jokes, such statements created an unpleasant atmosphere and caused concern among close ones. A few days before the tragedy, Marty mentioned to a neighbor that a real estate agent had come to them with an offer to sell the house. Marty was puzzled by this, which indicated how unaware he was of the real state of their affairs. The events of May 13, 2015 forever changed the lives of the Durham family and shook the quiet town of Sand Lake. The day began as usual, Marty and Glenna were at home, going about their daily business. The last time neighbors saw the couple alive was on May 11th, when Marty was mowing the Reem's lawn, and then he and Glenna spent about an hour chatting with Connie and Keith Reem. Glenna then mentioned problems with Marty's insurance company. On May 12th, Keith Reem tried to contact Marty, sending text messages and calling, but received no response. This was unusual as Marty usually responded quickly. Concerned about the lack of communication, Connie Ream came to the Durham's house several times on May 12th and 13th, but no one answered. Only the barking of their dog, Shelby, could be heard. On May 13th, around 4.30 p.m., Connie came to the Durham's house again and found that the front door was unlocked. Entering inside, she saw that the living room, which was usually tidy, was in disarray. In the bedroom, she found Glenna sitting by the bed, covered with a blanket up to her head, and Marty lying on the floor. Both were covered in blood. Connie immediately called for help from firefighters who happened to be nearby, responding to a fire on a neighboring street. When rescuers entered the house, they found that Glenna was still alive, although seriously injured. Marty, unfortunately, was already dead. The Sand Lake police quickly arrived at the scene. Detectives began a thorough examination of the crime scene, trying to understand what had happened in the Durham's house. Marty's body was found on the bedroom floor. An autopsy later showed that he had received five gunshot wounds, one in the back, one in the forearm, and three in the chest at close range. Marty was dressed only in underwear. Glenna was found with two gunshot wounds behind her ear, but her injuries were surprisingly minor. She was conscious, but initially couldn't provide any useful information about what had happened. At the crime scene, there were no signs of forced entry, and nothing had been stolen. This immediately raised suspicions among investigators. They also noticed the unusual placement of the bodies and traces of blood. In the living room, they found a chair with traces of blood, indicating that Glenna might have been shot there first. On the floor lay a pillow with two bullet holes, suggesting that Glenna had been shot through the pillow. Near the chair they found a Ruger revolver with six bullets and two empty cartridges. In the bedroom where Marty lay, four empty cartridges were found. A holster and a cartridge belt with bullets of different types lay on the bed. Investigators also noticed a bowl of spaghetti and a plate of garlic bread on the kitchen table, indicating the suddenness of the events that unfolded in the house. Glenna Durham was urgently taken to a hospital in Grand Rapids for medical care. Despite gunshot wounds to the head, her condition was stable and she remained conscious. This gave investigators an opportunity to conduct the first interrogation, albeit under limited circumstances. During the first conversation with detectives, Glenna claimed she didn't remember the events that led to the shooting. Her last memories, she said, were related to getting a flu shot and preparing for Mother's Day. In a state of severe emotional shock, she insisted I didn't shoot my husband. I would rather have divorced him and left. I know for sure I wouldn't have killed my husband. When asked about her familiarity with firearms, Glenna said that she sometimes accompanied Marty on hunting trips, but usually slept in the woods or read a book in the car. She admitted that she knew how to shoot, but didn't like it. 
She mentioned shooting pistols in their backyard, but emphasized her reluctance to use weapons. Glenna also expressed a wish that she hadn't been saved, saying she would like to be with Marty. When the detective asked if that's why she turned the weapon on herself, Glenna replied that she only felt this after waking up in the hospital. During the search of the Durham's house, investigators found several important pieces of evidence that shed light on the events leading up to the tragedy. In the living room, they found an envelope labeled personal. Inside were three letters two addressed to Glenna's children from her first marriage, Eric and Laura, and the third to her ex-husband Robert. In the letters, Glenna apologized and asked for forgiveness. In one of the letters, she wrote, I'm sorry, but I love you. I'm so sorry I've been disappointing you for the last 12 years or so. Please forgive me. You're one of the best things I've had. Love, Mom. When Glenna was asked about these letters, which looked like suicide notes, she said she didn't remember why she wrote them. She noted that she had written similar letters before, but couldn't explain why she wrote a letter to her ex-husband. Analysis of Marty and Glenna's phones also provided important information. Although both phones seemed to be cleaned, a search query made early in the morning on May 13th was found on Glenna's phone. The query concerned instructions for using a Ruger revolver, the same model of weapon used to kill Marty and injure Glenna. The last text message Glenna sent was to her mother at 9.30 p.m. on May 12th. In it, she was looking for lawnmowers. Glenna's mother, during questioning, explained that the apologetic message Glenna sent her was related to her daughter not showing up at her house as planned. This evidence created a complex picture of the events leading up to the tragedy and cast doubt on Glenna's version of complete memory loss. News of the tragedy in the Durham home quickly spread among relatives and friends. The reaction was one of shock and filled with grief. Marty and Christina's children, upon learning of their father's death, immediately came to the house. They were allowed to enter to take the dog Shelby and the parrot Bud. During this visit, they found a plastic bag in Glenna's drawer with more than 30 unpaid bills, which they handed over to investigators. Donna, Marty's sister, recalled her first emotions after the news. I felt anger I had never felt before. It was real rage. I felt like I could strangle her Glenna with my bare hands. This reaction reflected the depth of shock and pain felt by the family. Christina, Marty's ex-wife, was also deeply affected. Despite the divorce, she maintained a good relationship with Marty for the sake of the children. It's unfair. It's wrong. It's unfair that a man who fought for his life for the last 25 years was killed because of unnecessary lies, she said. Several weeks after the tragedy, an unexpected event occurred that added a new twist to the case. Christina, who had taken the parrot bud home, heard him repeating phrases that sounded like an argument between two people. At first, Christina didn't pay much attention to this. Bud often repeated phrases he had heard in the house, including commands for the dog Shelby and typical expressions of Marty. However, she later heard something that shocked her. The parrot clearly uttered the phrase in a male voice, Don't shoot. This was said in a voice that resembled Marty's. Christina was so struck that she decided to record it on video. Donna, Marty's sister, also listened to the recording and was deeply disturbed by what she heard. When Christina first sent me this video, I couldn't listen to it all the way through. It's very short, but I turned it off and listened again. It was really disturbing, Donna recalled. Although using a parrot as a witness in court seemed impossible, this unexpected statement from Bud generated significant interest from the public and media. Experts explained that parrots have a strong connection with their owners and can imitate sounds and phrases they hear, especially in stressful situations. This discovery became a turning point in the investigation, forcing investigators to reconsider their assumptions and focus on Glenna's role in the tragedy. A year after the tragic events, in June of 2016, police arrested Glenna Durham and charged her with first-degree murder. This decision was made based on the totality of evidence collected during the lengthy investigation. Glenna's arrest came as a surprise to many who knew the couple. 
Despite financial problems and strained relationships, few could imagine that the situation could lead to murder. Glenna continued to insist on her innocence. Her lawyers argued that the crime could have been committed by an outsider or another relative. However, the lack of signs of forced entry and the fact that nothing valuable was stolen cast doubt on this version. Preparation for the trial lasted several months. The prosecution carefully built their case, relying on physical evidence, expert testimony, and the couple's financial records. The main theory of the prosecution was that Glenna, faced with catastrophic financial problems due to her gambling addiction, decided to kill Marty. Prosecutors believed that she initially planned suicide, as evidenced by the farewell letters, but then decided to kill her husband, possibly after an argument. Glenna's defense was based on her claims of memory loss and inability to commit such a crime. Her lawyers emphasized the lack of direct evidence of her guilt and put forward alternative theories about a possible outside attacker. Both sides prepared for a complex trial. The prosecution intended to present a detailed picture of the couple's financial situation, the history of their relationship, and physical evidence from the crime scene. The defense planned to focus on possible alternative scenarios and emphasize Glenna's love for Marty. Particular attention was drawn to the question of the possibility of using the testimony of the parrot Bud. Although legally this was unlikely, the very fact of the existence of such unusual evidence added extra resonance to the case. Preparation for the trial also included jury selection, which was a difficult task due to the wide media coverage of the case and the small Sand Lake community, where many people knew the Durams personally. The trial of Glenna Durham began several months after her arrest and lasted 10 days. The courtroom was packed. Relatives, friends, journalists, and just interested local residents were eager to learn the truth about the tragedy that shook their community. The prosecution began with a detailed description of the Durham's financial situation. They presented evidence of significant debts, missed mortgage payments, and Glenna's large gambling expenses. Experts testified about how financial stress could lead to violent actions. A key moment was the analysis of Glenna's phone, which showed a search query for instructions on the Ruger revolver shortly before the murder. Prosecutors argued that this proved her intent to use the weapon. The defense insisted on Glenna's version of memory loss and her inability to commit such a crime. They presented a list of medications she was taking to restore cognitive functions after the injury. Testimony from ballistics experts was of particular interest. They explained the difference between the types of bullets found at the crime scene and how this could have affected the injuries to Marty and Glenna. An unexpected turn was the prosecution's decision to present the video with the parrot bud. Although this couldn't be direct evidence, Experts explain the ability of parrots to remember and reproduce phrases they hear, especially in stressful situations. After ten days of hearings, the case was handed over to the jury. They spent eight hours in the deliberation room, weighing all the presented evidence and arguments. Eventually, the jury reached a verdict Glenna Durham was found guilty of first-degree murder. The judge sentenced her to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. The reaction to the verdict was mixed. Marty's family felt some relief, believing that justice had prevailed. Donna, Marty's sister, said it was a moment of release. Release from everything being over. She will go to prison for life and won't come out of there. Glenna was shocked by the verdict and continued to insist on her innocence. She expressed outrage that the jury believed the words of a parrot. For many residents of Sand Lake, the verdict meant the end of a painful chapter in the history of their community. However, many questions remained about how such a tragedy could happen in their quiet town. The verdict in Glenna Durham's case had far-reaching consequences for everyone connected to this tragedy. Marty's family tried to find a way to live on, preserving his memory. Marty and Christina's children faced the difficult task of reconciling with the loss of their father and understanding their stepmother's role in this tragedy. Jessica, Marty's daughter, gave birth to her first child a boy, whom she gave the middle name Martin in honor of her father. Christina, Marty's first wife, took on the care of the parrot Bud. She said that Bud's return home was an emotional moment. He looked at me and I looked at him and it was like meeting an old friend. 
a family member you haven't seen for a very long time. Glenna Durham began serving her life sentence in state prison. She continued to insist on her innocence, but her appeals were rejected. After the conclusion of the trial, many tried to understand what led to such a tragedy. Experts and close ones expressed different opinions about Glenna's motives. Financial stress undoubtedly played a key role. Glenna's gambling addiction and accumulated debts created an explosive situation. Some suggested that she might have acted impulsively when Marty learned about the real state of their finances. Others pointed to the complex dynamics in their relationship. The tension between Glenna and Marty's children, as well as with his ex-wife, could have intensified feelings of isolation and frustration. Psychologists who analyzed the case noted possible signs of depression and suicidal intentions in Glenna, as evidenced by her farewell letters. Perhaps the initial suicide plan grew into a more tragic scenario. However, despite all attempts at analysis, the full picture of Glenna's motives remained unclear, especially given her claims of memory loss. The Durham case became an important lesson for many. It highlighted several key aspects that are worth considering, the importance of financial openness in marriage. Concealing debts and financial problems can lead to catastrophic consequences. The danger of gambling addiction. Glenna's story showed how gambling can destroy not only finances but also lives, the complexity of blended families. The tension between Glenna and Marty's children underscored the need for a careful approach to creating new family ties, the consequences of brain injuries. Marty's condition after the accident affected the dynamics of their relationship and his ability to control family affairs. The importance of mental health. Signs of Glenna's depression and suicidal thoughts were not noticed and addressed in time.